Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you all to this presentation. Uh, this presentation, I'll be speaking to building Docker images for ARM architectures. And I'll also be discussing and demonstrating how you can implement CI/CD pipelines to use automation and build your Docker images for these ARM architectures. Before I get into that, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Angel Rivera. I'm a developer advocate for CircleCI. And in my role at CircleCI, I'm engaging the developer community and understanding how they're using technologies, as well as some of the struggles or obstacles they face while implementing or using these technologies. I bring that information back to my team at CircleCI, and we use those learnings to build valuable features for our developers and our customers to ease their lives while developing software. If any of you want to reach out to me after this talk, uh, you know, to discuss the talk or discuss anything in general, uh, you can reach out to me via Twitter. Uh, my punk, uh, my punk, my Twitter handle is at punk data. So uh, again, if anyone wants to reach out and have a discussion or just, you know, to chat, uh, yeah, hit me up at punk data on Twitter. Uh, here are some fun facts about ARM. Uh, if you didn't know, ARM stands for Advanced Risk Machines. Although in 1984, when ARM was originated or created, uh, in England, uh, it was actually initially named the Acorn Risk Machine. In 1987, ARM became the first commercial risk processor available. And in 1990, the ARM LTD company was formed, and that's when the name changed to what it, it's currently known as the Advanced Risk Machines uh, uh, Processor. And, you know, ARM has been around for quite some time. Uh, in 1986, it was powering the Apple IIgs, and in 1993, it was also powering the Apple Newton device. Uh, so again, it's been around for quite some time, but in recent years, there's been some evolution or innovations made within the ARM architecture. Uh, if you didn't know, ARM processors power a lot of uh, smartphones, tablets, uh, Raspberry Pis, and also tons of IoT device and smart devices, such as televisions, appliances, and wearables. You know, ARM is pretty much in almost uh, all of the things that we probably use, you know, our mobile devices that we use on a day-to-day. -day. Uh, and it's been supported by pretty much all the major operating systems. Uh, it's definitely been supported by Linux for quite some time. Uh, you know, and I know that for a fact because I've been using Linux, Linux for many, many years and always have seen the Linux distributions, right, uh, for, for ARM, which is pretty, pretty cool that, you know, that operating system and that community has always kind of been there to support uh, those ARM architectures. Now, ARM is pretty popular in those, you know, mobile devices and IoT devices, smart devices, because... Uh, the ARM processor does a great job at processing data while using very low power. So uh, compared to the x86 processors, which are, you know, a bit snappier uh, and, and, and faster in certain regards, um, it still uses way more power than an ARM processor. So, you know, that's why it's kind of a great fit for uh, these uh, mobile devices, anything bad, uh, battery powered, right? ARM is a great fit for it because of this uh, low power consumption, and it's still pretty quick at processing data. So it's a, it's a good fit. Now, um, I want to talk about uh, ARM and, and implementations of ARM. I kind of gave you examples already about, you know, how it's powering smart devices, smartphones, um, you know, and all the uh, kind of battery powered devices. So I wanted to share some information about, you know, some of how ARM has kind of uh, been, the innovations within ARM have kind of been uh, applied to uh, a real world use case. So let's t talk about IoT sensors. Um, what I'm gonna use in my example is a moisture sensor, which is essentially detecting how much moisture is in something. Uh, in this case, I'm going to use the example of a moisture sensor in a farm, right? So this is a real world use case where uh, farmers are using moisture sensors to detect how much moisture is in the ground so that they know how much water uh, to, you know, apply to their crops. Uh, this is a great way for them to kind of be efficient with watering and also helps with their growing process. 
So if you look at the sensor that I'm showing you in the slide, um, has a little wire connected probably to a battery and you can imagine that also has a cellular type device to connect right uh, to a cell tower and then send the data from that moisture sensor back over to some server or some infrastructure that can capture that data and make sense of it. Uh, in this case, right, um, the moisture sensor probably has an ARM processor, uh, but you know, again, it's it's supposed to be a, a power, a battery powered device, right? Because you're sitting in a farm, you don't need to have cables everywhere. Uh, also, when you're picking the plants, you don't want to get caught up in any cables. So this is all kind of wireless technology, uh, but the idea is, you know, uh, those sensors should have a long battery life, and the only way to do that is to conserve uh, on things such as you know processing and then also uh, chirping or sending that data back to the data center um, in recent uh, years or, or yeah years you know this has evolved the, the arm chips have evolved they become more powerful they become uh, more efficient with power and one of the cool applications that I'm starting to see is, you know, when you have IOT devices sitting in a farm like this a remote, um, the, the farmers or the, the, the organizations that are, uh, you know, implementing, uh, these, these moisture sensors are now leveraging uh, something called an edge server and an edge server kind of sits a little bit physically closer to the moisture, uh, sensor so that it can capture the information. So it's no longer sending data, to you know a cloud and and consuming more battery power it's actually uh sending data to a device or or some sort of system that's on site next to or cl very in close proximity to the to the moisture sensor and it's not consuming a lot of power it's also uh, able to process data uh, you know directly from the sensor in kind of a, a near real-time situation and then send uh, a more polished or more refined data set back to the ultimate infrastructure right which is maybe some some server and some cloud system somewhere uh, but at the end of the day these edge services are, are basically like pre-processors right they're taking some information from the moisture sensor and then processing it uh, maybe doing some kind of uh, even AI on 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 the data and then sending you know data up to up to the uh, the final infrastructure that's capturing it so you know these are the kind of advancements that are being made um, and these these edge servers are starting to be powered by ARM uh, processors. And the reason is, number one, uh, the power, right? Consumption, again, uh, you know, even though you have a device that, that's, uh, you know, processing stuff, uh, it, it could still use a very, it, you know, benefit from using a very low power consumption. And the ARM processor does that. Uh, the other part to that is the ARM processors are getting faster. So they're able to, um, you know, uh, process that information just as good as an x86 architecture so yeah be on the lookout for kind of these arm powered edge devices which are you know kind of uh becoming uh, the norm within iot type architectures and it's a pretty interesting time to be uh you know viewing or, or seeing how how this is ad advancing and, and the innovations that they're making so again right um with the iot uh services or, or device edge edge devices um they're going to need iot edge applications right so those devices are going to need to run applications that you know whenever the the data from the sensor comes in it's going to have to you know do some calculations or or maybe even uh do some sort of you know uh machine learning type situations where it's identifying patterns of watering patterns right and then spitting out the best uh the best times to water or you know any kind of application like that but at the end of the day uh those edge server devices are gonna need iot uh edge applications to run them on and what i'm seeing a ton of is um these devices are running uh some form of kubernetes right uh, and that's where kind of where if you're running kubernetes you're definitely going to have to be running uh your application inside of a docker image and that's where we have to build uh, Docker images that support ARM architectures. And I'll get into that in a few. Uh, so another application for ARM architectures or CPUs or processors are for ARM powered servers. 
um, some cloud co companies now are actually offering up uh, cloud resources or compute nodes that are ARM powered, right? Uh, that means the, the underlying hardware that hosts your virtual machines are using an ARM processor and also uh, requires you to use an ARM uh, capable kernel. Uh, and the reason is because, um, you know, ARM and x86 architectures are not compatible. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, they just use different instruction sets, right? So the processors understand uh, their directives in a different way. And that's basically one of the reasons why, you know, you can't use an x86 architecture or kernel uh, or applications with an ARM uh, uh, processor. Uh, it will not understand the application, right? It, their application is built for a specific instruction set and you can't mix and match those. So that means, you know, you have to compile your code to whatever architecture you're targeting uh, because actually the code doesn't really care about where it's operating on, uh, but the, the hardware actually cares about what kind of uh, software is being compiled and executed on it, right? So uh, the software, if it's built for x86, and again, you're running it on an ARM uh, hardware, it's not gonna understand, the, the process is not gonna end the so understand the software and what it's trying to do. So that also uh, kind of uh, leads into uh, Docker images, that incompatibility, right? So with ARM, uh, you, you need to be cognizant of when you're building Docker images that you're building to an ARM architecture and not an x86 architecture. So ARM compatible Docker images, right? Uh, again, you need to need to be, be cognizant of where you're targeting. Uh, and again, if you're targeting an ARM uh, architecture, you obviously need to build for that Docker image for an ARM uh, processor, right? So one of the ways you can easily do that is by implementing, you know, building your Docker images within CI/CD pipelines. Um, that streams line, streamlines the process. The problem is a lot of the uh, current uh, CI/CD uh, providers uh, don't have ARM uh, building capabilities or ARM uh, capabilities to build your software. They don't have the hosts in in the runtime to build your software. Uh, but you're in luck, CircleCI has actually recently released uh, that uh, ARM uh, resources. So we now have the ability for people to leverage uh, ARM uh, in their in their CICD pipeline. So you can build your application to an x86 platform, or if you choose to, you can also build it for an ARM architecture. And the way we did that is providing what we call resource classes, which again are ARM capable underlying hardware right where you're running your code so with that uh addition of the arm resource classes uh we're able to allow uh, developers to build uh, their applications compile them for arm right and they also can build docker images that support the arm architecture uh, and that'll give a nice clean arm uh feel across the board so you can test your applications in arm you can run uh, you know, your code on an ARM uh, hardware or ARM uh, processor and know that the applications, the Docker images and anything you build uh, on that platform, the ARM, ARM platforms within your CICD pipeline are going to function uh, in whatever ARM architecture you're targeting, which in this case could be a Kubernetes cluster. So in this demonstration, I'm going to go and show you how uh, you can implement a CI/CD pipeline within Circle CI that actually builds, tests, and deploys an ARM-capable Docker image to a newly created infrastructure. Okay, so in this demonstration, I have some code, and what I'm showing you here is a project that I use uh, to demonstrate a bunch of things. Uh, in this case, I'm going to show you uh, how to build a CI/CD pipeline that enables uh, ARM support within it, right? So you can build things uh, within your CI/CD pipeline that target the ARM architecture. Uh, the first thing I wanna talk about is this application. So this project, again, don't, we're, I don't want you to focus on the application. Uh, we should be focusing more on the CI/CD pipeline that automates a lot of things. Uh, but I just wanted to call out that this is a simple application I used to demonstrate things. Uh, and it's a simple Node.js application that just serves up a web page. Uh, and, and the pipeline has a few tests, it does a bunch of things, but at the end of the day, it's just a simple static website to demonstrate uh, the pipeline. So 
before we get started, I'm going to jump in and show you how you build a pipeline within Circle CI. Uh, and this is a pipeline, what we call CI CD pipeline configuration file. Uh, it lives in a .circle CI directory, and then within that, you have to have a config.yaml file. And essentially, what it does is creates, uh, you know, the directives or defines the directives for your CI CD pipeline. So let's start with the three components. Um, obviously, you're going to have to set a version, right? This just tells the system that you want to use version 2.1. So Circle CI on the back end knows which uh, system or application it use, needs to pr pr process this, this uh, configuration file. Uh, the orbs here are, sent, are basically a Circle CI specific key. Uh, what that does is we have what we call orbs, a system where you can uh, package up functionality into reusable uh, encapsulation is what I like to use. Um, and you can basically take that functionality and inject it wherever you want in your CICD pipeline without having to write a lot of code. You kind of write it once and then popu you know, populate uh, the objects with, with values within its parameters. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute. But essentially what we're doing here is uh, going to talk about jobs and commands and then workflows. So a job is a grouping of commands. So think of jobs as a grouping of things that you want to execute in order to achieve a specific goal. In this case, I wanna run my test. So that's a job that essentially will test my code. And in order to do that, we need to run our code, right? In a specific um, runtime. Uh, this is where we call, what we call an executor when you're running this code. And every, every job needs a place to run, right? Or execute code on. In this case, I'm, I'm choosing a machine uh, executor. We have a, a variety of different ones, but in this, this example, we're gonna use machine because uh, it, it, machine is the only one that currently has the ARM architecture support. So you wanna declare a machine. Uh, obviously you're gonna need an operating system or, or some sort of yeah, operating system to run on that machine or that virtual machine. So we wanna use an Ubuntu uh, 2004 uh, image. And then the resource class, this is where you actually implement ARM into your, into your uh, CICD pipeline. So this will give you uh, a runtime that is underneath the hood is running an ARM uh, enabled hardware, right? So the ARM microchip or processor is is in the uh, in, in the actual virtual machine. It's not an emulation, which, you know, you could get by with emulation, like a Kimu emulation of ARM. But I like to be very, very sure that, you know, uh, my application is going to run in the ARM architecture if I'm targeting that. And it doesn't get any any more, uh, I guess, generic or uh, genuine than having right the hardware that you're running on uh, be an actual ARM processor. So again, if you want to implement that in your CI/CD pipelines, you have to, you know, basically define this resource class, uh, which again is the the type of uh, virtual machine you're going to run. And in this case, you know, we're going to run the ARM architecture. Now, if you take away this ARM period and just say medium, then it'll just run an x86 uh, architecture by default. So once that that's kind of like ARM, really easy, right? Really easy implementation of how you would would uh, actually uh, engage your uh, uh, job to run on an on a ARM architecture. Uh, the next uh, steps here, right, uh, this, this key would just list the things you want to run, right? So this is the commands that I was talking about, the grouping of commands. It's just a list of commands that we're going to run. As you can see here, I'm just going to test my code, and then I'm going to save those test results and pin them to the, to the pipeline. So before I do that, though, uh, before I get any further, let's talk about building Docker images here, right? Um, this is actually a little bit easier. Uh, we're doing things on ARM, right? Again, in order to build the Docker image, you have to, for ARM, you have to have an ARM resource class uh, or you should have one. Again, you could, you could actually use uh, an emulator to do that, but I like to kind of make sure that uh, the, the uh, application that I'm, or the architecture that I'm targeting, I'm running my applications, testing them on those target uh, architectures because emulation is fine, but there are some, like quirks and, and differences that uh, I'm just not comfortable with. Uh, so one thing before you, we even get into the Docker build portion, um, this is really, really important. Like I mentioned earlier, because we are targeting uh, this Docker image to run on an ARM architecture, we need to inherit from an ARM uh, 
capable image, right? So, you know, in Docker, when you're building Docker images in your Docker file, you have this from clause. And basically what that's doing is pulling in uh, layers, right? That you want to include. And then your, your Docker file builds on top of those layers. Uh, in this case, um, when you're when you're dealing with Docker, especially from the, the Docker Hub repositories, you want to prefix any of your images with this ARM 64 V8 uh, prefix, right? So if you're targeting V8, now you could have V6, V7, I think, but I don't think it goes any lower than that. This is really really important though. This line right here, if you're targeting a, a build, uh, you know, to build a Docker image for an ARM architecture, make sure that you have. Uh, that prefix uh, before your images so that uh, your Docker file knows how to build this. So again, this is key. This is really important. Now, what I want to do though, um, you know, go through the, the Docker build real quick uh, because uh, in the interest of time, uh, as, as you can see, right, the keys are the same. We're going to use a Docker um, or disregard, we're going to use a machine executor, and then we're going to use a, an ARM resource class. Uh, and then we're using the orbs, right? So remember when we're talking about orbs, this is a declaration of the orb within the YAML file. So this is kind of like an import statement if you're using like a programming language. Um, it's equivalent to that. And then this is how you would declare uh, the parameters uh, or commands that are within that, that orb. So commands are the like a function, right? In, a, in an object class, you can just call it and then tell it what to do and then this 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 command has parameters right so it needs to know uh, the name of your docker image that you want to build and then maybe you are going to give it a tag in this case we're going to pin it to the pipeline number uh, of, of of our pipeline and then the orb has a push command right and again you're going to have to give it a docker name and a tag and what these two things do is essentially uh, you know, have underlying code that will build your Docker image and then it will also push it to Docker Hub in this case is where I want to push it. So that's the orb, right? It's just providing functionality and it's kind of like, uh, you know, encapsulated functionality that's reusable, shareable, and it's hosted on CircleCI's registry. So if you want to look for more information on that, just go to CircleCI orb registry, uh, do a search for that and it'll, it'll take you right there. So let's go ahead and show how to build uh, Docker images, right? Really easily. So let's say I'm a developer and I wanna test my application or I, I'm making changes to my application, I should say. Uh, let's go ahead and change this version number to three, just a simple change, right? Uh, and then we're gonna save this. Uh, and then let's uh, go ahead and just do like a, uh, uh, I like to do this manually. So we can do like a get clear and get, get status, right? And then um, it tells me, yeah, I have this application. So I'm just going to do a git uh, commit. And I want to say uh, A. And then the message is uh, changed version number. Just for cool. And in order for me to trigger my build, all I got to do is a git push, right? So the same developer workflow that we all work with every day. Uh, this will, this is the circle CI dashboard and my change should be, uh, showing up here momentarily. Uh, at least it should kick off my build pipeline. If I did push it, which I don't think I did this, I did, uh, and let me do a refresh. Okay. So for some reason it didn't pick it up, but it did now. Um, and we have a running build, right? And if we drill into this, uh, here's a quick, easy pipeline, right? I'm gonna uh, run my tests, which I showed you earlier, and then we're gonna build a Docker image. And then finally, I'm going to deploy uh, to an AWS ECS cluster, which I have here. So if we recall correctly, we have, um, or if we, if I recall correctly, yeah, so the, the, the image name will be 73, uh, something, 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 tag 73, right? Because uh, if you look at my code, I have um, in the config file, uh, the tag uh, for, for building this is the pipeline number, and that's the pipeline number here is 73. So if I, if I click here, you can see that um, the, the application is, is being uh, you know, compiled and run, and my, my uh, CircleCI uh, pipeline is actually processing uh, the config file and it's doing all the things I directed it to do. In this case, I want to deploy to AWS ECS. 
Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at that in a moment. So let's check in on our cluster. Uh, so I'm going to click in here. As you can see, my pipeline has been completed. Uh, I've ran a Terraform uh, scripts to create this cluster, VPC and all, and uh, deploy the application, right? Deploy this Docker image to the ECS cluster. So let's take a look at our current um, host name. So this code creates the load balancer VPC and the cluster and all the resources involved. Um, so I want to go ahead and take a look at the application. It should be running and it is, uh, but it's still using a, an older version, right? So in a few minutes, we should see a version 13 populate here. Uh, but while we wait for that to happen, I'm going to show you the Amazon uh, EC2, e ECS cluster, I should say. Uh, and, you know, essentially, right, uh, like I said, Terraform had built this. Um, it's pretty much running uh, uh, the uh, cluster on uh, Am Amazon Graviton2 uh, instances. And for those of you that don't know, those uh, Graviton instances are Amazon's ARM uh, infrastructure or compute nodes, right? So if we drill, drill into one of these, uh, we should be able to see the type, which is a Graviton. So this uh, T4G, the G itself is a, is a Graviton designator, uh, means uh, the, ap the application is running on a uh, EC2 compute node that uh, has an ARM, uh, an ARM processor on it, right? So now that um, we know that our ECS cluster is a Graviton2 or ARM capable cluster, we, un we can see that our, our uh, Docker image will run, right? And that's the whole point of this pipeline is to ensure that my application is running uh, within the ARM architecture. As you can see here, uh, the version number that we have is number uh, 13, which is uh, the one I updated in my code. Uh, if you look at the application, yeah. And this is the variable that holds that version number and it's, it's uh, 0 0.0.13 which is pretty cool. Um, now go back, going back to the pipeline, uh, as you can see, we, we, you know, this is the, the deploy to ECS job. Uh, if we go into the build, um, we have this thing called approve destroy. And what this button does is essentially, if you click it, it's a manual process. Normally I would use this to test the application and do all these you know, things and it wouldn't be a manual process. But since, you know, for this demonstration, uh, I wanted to also show that, you know, these pipelines also have this manual capability and I'm gonna approve the destruction of this infrastructure. Uh, so once I click that, then um, it's gonna kick off my destroy AWS ECS job. And then this cluster after this job uh, finishes processing will be no more. So that's basically it. Uh, remember that, you know, when you're building Docker images, the, the, the main thing uh, that you wanna do in your Docker files, ensure that you have this ARM64, uh, you know, V8 or V7 uh, prefix in front of your Docker image in your from, from command. And then you also want to, if you're using CircleCI to build uh, ARM, uh, you know, resource, uh, uh, ARM uh, pipelines, you want to make sure that you're using the resource class that uh, stated arm dot medium large or whatever size you need uh, within that. So I hope this was useful, uh, and I want to thank you all for uh, you know listening to me talk about arm building Docker images and CI/CD. Thank you very much.